신대매 고모림 부채 신대매 신대매 부채 고모림 부채 As you mentioned in one of the teachings, the main goal of your first trip to Europe is to re-establish the connections with all disciples and gain new ones. How does it feel to a Lama to meet with all disciples? Well, meeting all disciples, if, they don't, if I don't see the enthusiastic in their eyes, it makes me feel sad. But the moment I see the amount of love and affection and joy that they have, from their side to see me, and it just brings me a sort of same level of enthusiasm. And uh, it's like, finally we meet again kind of feeling, you know, and it's really, really, really makes me happy. Really, really, really. That's what I also said in, when I was in one center in France, because that center had a connection with the previous Gomu And so when they invited me, I told them I'm so deeply honored, not just because you guys invited me, just because it's me, but because there was a connection with the previous Kumutu, and I felt that you honored that relationship. And for, to know that you guys are keeping that sort of relationship alive made me just really humble and, 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 and really rejoice the fact that this, this bond is still strong, uh, from a Dharma point of view especially, because otherwise this is just a bond. It's, but it's all because of Dharma, because of the teacher-student relationship. And now as a friend, but because of that previous relationship, it's still continuing. So, and about new, uh, new. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily yet call new disciples, but people that I meet, new people. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to see people that are interested in my talks, and especially when they go back home, or when when they leave, saying that they, it was really effective the talk for them. I've met some people that were not even Buddhist. You know, they came to me saying, "Oh." You I'm not a Buddhist, but really, your talk really meant a lot to me. Those really, it really moved me, and, and, and you know, I can understand. So these kind of comments makes me feel like I'm, I'm making a difference, and there's a purpose of my tour. This, you know, so, yeah. 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 We heard about your strong connection with the 22nd Gomori How do you feel? to meet your teacher in much younger form, physical body. And the suit, and this crown, this leg. <laughs> I, I, first I was very touched, very pleased, definitely, to, to meet uh, with Rinpoche uh, again. Uh, we first met, but very briefly, in Serra J, uh, when Rinpoche was nine years old because actually Rinpoche's house was two houses afar from where I was mm. uh, living in Serra. But uh, two weeks ago was the first uh, time that we met again uh, as adults. Uh, of course the form changes, the appearance changes, but the obviously for me the energy and the, the wisdom and the compassion is the same very much still present, very much still a, a feelable. So Thank you. <laughs> I should say no comment. <laughs> no. We can see a lot of similarities between the teacher and disciple. The previous Gomutul Kareem Pachin was a Lama, having wife and a family. Now the 23rd Gomutul Kurim Pochen, as his previous incarnation, has left monastic life. Can we say there is a reason behind? With other words, can we say both of you have special purpose to promote Buddhist ethical view, especially for lay people? This would be a question to both. Hmm. Um, I cannot really speak for my grandfather, the previous Gomutulku. Uh, I haven't met him. I didn't get to know his purpose. Although I know we can see the benefit that he has made in many people's lives. Um, but from my point of view, I think um, the two similarities that we may have is our main mission that we have is to help others, to share our experience, our knowledge on Dharma. The previous Komotuku has so much initiation, so much 
um, knowledge on zhi, ritual dance, ritual chants, how to care for others, because he was also a father on a, in, a, in a place where they were taking care of a lot of kids. So he really had that sort of experience on how to care for others. And so when, when the time came, when the, when the karma connected, Tijan Rumbuchi said, why do you come here to ask me for the, I think it was Vajra Yuhi initiation, you should go ask Tukuma uh, Rumbuchi who's living right next to you, because it was a community of Masuri that went to Tijan uh, for asking to give Vajra Yuhi initiation all the way to Dharamsala. Jeremy said, why you come all the way here? When you got someone right next to you who's a mass who's mastered in the Bajayugini practice. And they were like, okay. So even though they knew Gomutsuku, they didn't know he was such a person that Tijan Ramuchi revered as, you know, as someone, you know, someone, someone special and someone who, who really knew a lot. And so when they asked him, that's when finally the time came for Gomutsuku to really flourish his Dharma. So until then, there was no real connection that I was being able to make for some karmic reason. But that was the time then when they asked him, then he started from him. Then suddenly everyone knew about Gomutsuga and his sort of uh, knowledge and, 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 and teachings. And that's when many high lamas started to come, Lama Yeshe, Bakula Rinpoche, Gelek Rinpoche, many, many lamas started to come to receive teachings from Gomutsuga. And so even though he was a lay lama, he, he totally dedicated himself to flourish the Dharma and travel and do whatever he could to, to pass on the, all the initiations he had. On this one, I don't have that much initiations yet. But at least from my experience and what I've learned from the monastery and my experience as a lay person, combining the two experiences, I feel like there's much I can give, much I can provide to help those who are in similar situation that are Buddhist but maybe a bit uh, confused and trying to figure out how to practice the Dharma. Um, and so, and, and also for those who don't have much time to practice Dharma, because um, Dharma is, there's many ways you can learn Dharma, many, many, many methods, many, uh, it depends on, it's like, it depends on what you have. It's like the amount of money you have, you can invest. The more money you have, the more things you can invest in, but you can always invest in something. Same thing, the amount of time you have, depends on what you can practice. And no matter, even if you only have five minutes a day, there's still a type of practice that you can do every day. And so that's what I'm trying to tackle right now. It's to those people who think they don't have much time, this kind of, uh, I feel like there's something that I can contribute. So I'm trying my best to do that right now. Yes, as uh, about me, I spent um, actually so far the most of my life as a monk, because I was monk for 23 years. But it became quite clear at some point that the Dharma came into the West, that the majority of people who are interested by Dharma in the West uh, are not monastics, are lay people having a mm. job, a family life, uh, um, community life, uh, or in politics, or in medicine, and so on. Mm. And there was a big... Uh, concerned about how to provide the Dharma teaching in a way which is accessible, which is understandable, and without any barrier between uh, the Dharma teaching I, I always tried to, to promote and those people. Mm. And I felt at some point that the, the ordination, the, the fact of being dressed differently, of having different manners, was a kind of obstacle, like a little barrier, which mm -hmm. was not necessary anymore. So at some point I gave back the ordination and uh, continued as a lay person, also under the advice of one of my teacher, who said that the Dharma activity would be more uh, beneficial, would flourish, uh, more if I would continue my work as a lay lama, which I did and which I do not regret in any way because also I entered into the family, uh, family life, taking care of the children, uh, having uh, now a baby, 
experiencing what uh, all the other people in the society have experienced or will experience through this uh, event, which I can relate now, uh, which I, I can probably also understand better. And I see a lot of benefits in practicing the Dharma in everyday moments and being able to transmit that experience as well. Not just the monastic experience and years of being a monk, but uh, years of uh, taking care ch of children every day, uh, how to practice patience, how to practice care, attention, uh, compassion, of course. Uh, though uh, some days are not easy and uh, some day the baby doesn't sleep uh, the whole night and uh, mm. we wake up with uh, the eyes like this. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there is Dharma, this is our life and uh, Dharma goes on in every minute. Nowadays there is a huge pressure on people to be somebody important, to be successful, rich, influential. Everything around, everything revolves around boosting your ego, which is completely opposite to the Dharma, since our aim is renunciation from samsara. In such society, is it possible to be a genuine Dharma practitioner and happy, successful in the 21st century? What would be Shantanarimpuja's opinion? Definitely, it is possible. Uh, the society has changed from maybe past time or past centuries, but the mind, human mind, remains the same, has the same uh, craving, has the same wish, has the same uh, capacity as well. So, as Rinpoche said before, uh, even if somebody has a very short time uh, per day, because there is a family, because there is a job and so on, mm. that time can be dedicated to the practice. And it's not necessarily the length that we spend in the practice which is important, it's the intensity and the faith that we have in that practice. So mm -hmm. in many ways we can say that five minutes of intense practice is really the wish and the aim of reaching enlightenment or at least benefiting the others mm -hmm. is in some way more important than some people who will spend years and years claiming to be a good Dharma practitioner, claiming to be uh, um, a great person because they receive so many uh, transmission here and there. They, you know, sometimes there is also in, in some center people who make like a collection of initiation and believe to be great because of that list. But that list has no meaning if the people do not have the faith. I'm not talking about blind faith. I'm talking about this intensity that you have inside yourself which drive you on the Dharma path, which, which really pulls you even when you are tired, even when you are exhausted, even when the baby didn't sleep or whatever circumstance. Mm. You really want to uh, develop your mind towards a better understanding of emptiness, a better understanding of the true nature of reality and bodhicitta. Bodhicitta being the grounds of the path. Why? I mean, you cannot reach enlightenment without bodhicitta. And actually, why would you reach enlightenment if you don't have this bodhicitta? What enlightenment would mean mm -hmm. if the core motivation is not to help uh, all the other sentient beings, as many mm -hmm. other sentient beings after them. So whatever the society is today, I believe that everybody can practice the Dharma in a way or in another. We said that there are 84,000 teachings. Uh, so there are 84,000 ways which could be applied differently. So whoever people are, whatever they are engaged into, whatever negativity they might have done or, uh, or whatever good they have done in the past, they can engage into the Dharma. They can engage into the practice. Just need to wish it and to find a way to find the, the tool or the means uh, for them to understand what they are worth, what they can achieve, the, the Buddha nature they have inside themselves. Right? So you mentioned emptiness and bodhicitta, and we know that like the third pillar of the path is also renunciation. So what would Guru Rinpoche 
would uh, your advice be? What's the best reminder of the renunciation from samsara in our everyday life? Mm. Is to understand that all these materialistic things and you know, the life, the kind of life that we live in, the kind of uh, engagement that we have in this sort of samsaric world, is not the ultimate truth. That is very important to kind of remind yourself and understand that that is the cause of 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 something that can help you. Because there's two ways you can see it. Either the cause of suffering or the cause to help you practice the Dharma. So now because you're in this human form. Otherwise, if you were in an animal form, you would not have that, that, sort of, mm, that sort of mind to be able to think in such way as humans can do. And if you were born in the God realm, you would be so, to be direct, sucked into such lust and pleasure, that you would not even care to think of Dharma. This is no, it does nothing to you because you're not having any suffering. Only until the last minute, and I think we, all, we know a lot of the stories about the God's realm. Um, so the point is to be really to rejoice that we've been reborn as a human, as as humans, and that, and and so, whatever we have, we have to be able to utilize it for the purpose of achieving closer to Buddhahood. Closer, 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 ultimately to become a Buddha. But you cannot think that you can jump uh, and, 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 and reach the 20th step. That's what I like to say all the time. Uh, you cannot think that you can become Usain Bolt in the first time you run. No, you've got to take baby steps. You've got to take baby steps. But you've got to also enjoy and rejoice every step you make, every... Every progress you make, you gotta rejoice it and feel that you're making, you're getting closer to the to the goal you're going uh, going towards to. And so, for that reason, uh, the main point of I think renunciation is is that to really learn not to be attached and to learn ultimately learn that this is not the ultimate truth. You know, there's many ways you can see renunciation. And one of the, I think, very effective ways to understand this is not the ultimate truth. I will, I will drink, I will drink water, I will eat cakes, I may maybe have some fun listening to some music or, mm, I don't know, just uh, driving around, maybe a nice car. But ultimately, I will use this to help me improve my practice. So it could be learning attachment. So when you face attachment, you will understand how attachment works. So when you understand attachment works, you understand what are the causes. So you buy a nice car, if someone scratches it, ah, see? The suffering that I gain from that attachment. So there's many ways, that this is a bit of a tantric kind of approach. But in the end, it's, it's, it's basically how you can utilize whatever you have in the right path. This is very important. And sometimes people don't understand that and they think you have to renounce every. Renounce means you have to give up everything and somehow live a very... A life that is almost like what the Buddha said at the Buddha time when he was with his five other fellow uh, yogis. I can't remember what they're exactly called, but like similar to sadhus. And they renounce everything and literally everything, even giving up food and only having one grain of rice, I think, every day. And he realized that was not the way to live. That was not the path. Because this was affecting his mind. Because if, you, if, you, if you're malnourished, if you're not nourished well physically, I mean, if your body's not nourished well, your mind can't think well. Because the mind functions according to the body. And so that's when he realized moderation was the path. So uh, I think in the end it's really important how to utilize what we have. And, and, and learn that that's ultimately not the truth. But it's just a way to use it to improve our practices, basically. Yeah. You mentioned the Buddha and his fellow students from ancient times, and that now obviously the society is completely different, so much distractions and everything. Mm. Do you think it was easier to be a practitioner of Buddhism in previous ancient times? I definitely uh, wished was born at the I was I was there at Buddha's time and receiving teaching from him. 
I think that would, uh, that would, I think we can both agree on that. I think that can, uh, similar to the story that I was giving before, that, uh, this, that this great saint, when he cried, uh, when we were seeing the Buddha as a baby, and when the king, the father, asked why are you crying, it was because I'm crying not because of something the bad will happen to the baby, but I'm crying because I will not get to be here alive and to see him becoming a Buddha, to become enlightened. So I think, uh, yes, I think uh, if I got to practice a Buddha time, I think uh, I think it would be quite, quite a bit different. Yes, a bit different. <laughs> a bit different. But, but nonetheless, nonetheless, we're not practicing this. Uh, sorry, sorry. There's hope to practice. Of this course, story. nonetheless, I was going to say that it's 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 still not a lost cause. Thankfully, Buddha, Buddhism has survived until now. We still have great teachers and great lamas. The only, the only if, mm, challenge is now ourselves, whether we are strong enough to resist all these distractions and be able to not to be distracted by them. doesn't mean that you have to run away from it. doesn't mean you cannot enjoy it time to time. But doesn't mean that, but to learn to not think that's the ultimate truth again. To learn that that's uh, not be attached to the point where if you don't get it, you suffer. That's the problem of attachment. It's not to, not, be, not to enjoy it, it's not to suffer from it. Because attachment is being suffering. Everything is about how to reduce suffering, how to get rid of suffering. If you don't suffer from enjoying listening to music, then it's okay, you can listen to music. <laughs> you know. But if you're suffering from it, then you should understand what are the causes and start to find out to eliminate the cause of that suffering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche introduced the expression of spiritual materialism. What do you think spiritual materialism is more characteristic in West? How to avoid it? Maybe yeah. the problem is uh, that either in the past time or nowadays we are dealing with human mind. So even if the, the, the conditions for the, the practice and the conditions for the teaching might have changed in the sense of have, have worth, worsened a little bit nowadays in comparison to Buddha's time when the energy, the connection, the blessing was so strong that listening to one teaching allowed to realize it. Nowadays, of course, it is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more difficult. But still, we are we are talking about the human mind, with its uh, downfall and with its capacity, its potential. Now, a certain amount of people who are entering into the path, whatever path it is will try to use it for their own benefit. The ego is sneaky enough to try to find how uh, you can benefit from, from uh, what you are engaged into. I was mentioning before the, some practitioner who make the list of uh, the uh, initiation they have received as if because they receive them they are better than other people. Mm -hmm. This is spiritual materialism. Yes. Somebody who has studied for 20 years, 25 years, who knows a lot, who can uh, debate eventually very, very nicely and defeat most of the people, if that practitioner does not pay very uh, much attention to his own ego, uh, the ego will seize this pride of being a very good debater, very good um, in words. But the words are not leading us to enlightenment. It's not a book or thousands of books that we would learn by heart which will bring us to enlightenment. What brings us to enlightenment is experience. And experience comes from meditation. Meditation is what brings us from the knowledge into the experience. And this is achievable if we can tame our mind if we understand the meaning of renunciation, if we understand the meaning of emptiness, if we understand the meaning of bodhicitta. These are concepts that we can learn easily about from a book, but if we do not meditate well 
deep enough, uh, with uh, genuine dedication, we will not realize them. That means you can sit, you can take the position of meditation and make a lot of uh, words and noise in your, in your head, you will not realize emptiness. You need to have a pacification of the mind. Pacification of the mind comes from a certain humility, with a good motivation, with uh, a specific care, uh, a specific attention to the ego, so that the ego does not fall into grasping even the spirituality. Because if you grasp or if you seize with attachment and greed everything which comes from the spiritual path for your own benefit, it will bother your mind rather than to freedom. It will not allow you to go beyond the, the illusory nature of this reality because you grasp on this reality. Mm -hmm. This is spiritual materialism, or this is at least how I understand it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I don't see much as much that I can add on this, except for just a small experience that I have from, from Buddha Center, I, guess I tell my friends all the time. Sometimes I feel like, uh, sometimes, obviously not all the time, but sometimes I feel like uh, um, the Buddhist centers tend to have more um, strange people, more than the city people, you know? <laughs> Just because it's kind of a concentration of everyone trying to be or look, I don't know, different. Um, thankfully, not it's not always the case. Um, and I see, in my own experience, people who will come to me and say, Oh, Rinpoche, I've been a Buddhist for 30 years. I'm a, I'm a Buddhist for 20 years. I'm a Buddhist in this year. And um, it's kind of interesting when they say that, because we don't, I, where I came from, we don't have this culture of seeing how long we've been Buddhist. Uh, and uh, somehow mentioning, I mean, obviously if you asked, it's something else, but without having to ask, already c approaching me in a way, claiming that who they are in, in such a way, gives me this kind of an idea or feeling that maybe they are quite attached to that number of how many years they've been a Buddhist. Number one. Number two, uh, many of them when they deal with new Buddhists, they have this kind of a, mm, not a very friendly vibe. They can be quite uh, aggressive sometimes. They can be, you know, they can be just uh, mm, don't have the right behavior of a, of a Buddhist. The right behavior is very important. The right speech, the right behavior, and the right thoughts. And they don't have that, and I can see that. And uh, and then, then they always tend to, when people come up with suggestions or ideas, then they, without even listening to what they're saying, they will kind of neglect it and have this attitude of something that there's no way that you can know more than me kind of attitude. And that That's quite painful to see. Because it's someone, not because it's someone doing that, because mainly because it's someone that claims that he knows Buddhism more. And because of the Dharma that he knows more from his thought, he's using that in a very such negative way. So that makes it even more painful, not just on a human level, but even from a Dharma point of view, it just made it more heavier to see. And, and, and that's exactly what Buddhists and the Dharma, the Buddha would, wouldn't want to happen. And so it's very important to be humble, to be to be always open to ideas, no matter how long you've been a Buddhist, no matter what background you come from, but at least give them a chance to speak and to understand what they have to say. And to be that open enough, I think is very important for any Buddhist. Uh, and, and, and honestly, for everybody, for every non-Buddhist or non-Buddhist. So, yeah. And there are probably some differences in approach between East and West and practitioner from East and West. Shantanabhi, uh, which your previous reincarnation was Lama, Lama in Rabi, a respected Tibetan Lama. In this life, you were born in a simple French family, far from Buddhist environment. Is it challenging to be a Western Lama in the West? Well, I didn't ask myself so much this question. Um, 
because it is simply the reality. Uh, I'm born in the West, in a non-Buddhist family, and I had to make my way to the Dharma and to because that was my aim, because that was my wish. And I become a monk and I entered the monastery and I wanted to learn enough so to be able to practice, enough so to be able to help other people, not just from the Dharma point of view. I done some medical study in Paris at the time in order to go to take care of the Seraji Menkan, Seraji mm -hmm. Hospital for a for few years. Um, that was part of my understanding of the Dharma, as a matter of fact. It was not two things separate, my monk life and my hospital life. Mm -hmm. It was one and the same. But this is what I can do, this is what I'm happy to do. Now, in the West, surely the, the, the Dharma practitioner or the Lamas in general uh, have less support from the community because the community is structured differently, because uh, back in Tibet, Everybody was Buddhist anyhow. So uh, you were a Lama or you were a practitioner or a monk and uh, you were probably m better supported in your activity uh, because it was natural, because it was cultural than in the West. In the West there are some added difficulties to make your way, to maintain your way uh, of teaching of organizing seminar or organizing teachings here and there. So maybe it is a little bit more challenging from, from that aspect. But I'm not saying this as a regret. Uh, it is as it is. It is uh, important to be in the West because a lot of people are interested uh, in Dharma and it was important for the Dharma to flourish and spread over uh, the Western countries. So yes, there, there are some differences and maybe it is a little bit dif more difficult in the West. As Rinpoche said before, we can also use the difficulty that we encounter uh, to strengthen our motivation and to strengthen our wish to, to maintain the practice and to maintain the way to help the others. If because something is difficult, we give up, uh, we don't go far. So maybe a more difficult, but maybe more challenging, and through this challenge, more energy to walk on the, on, on the path. You had mentioned that um, besides this Buddhist education, you also entered into this medical education, and moreover, you both have taken some profession. For example, you were to even become a musician, mm. like as you explained in the teachings. Um, so I was wondering what was the purpose of this choice and uh, mm -hmm. in what way do you think music can turn our, our minds toward basic goodness? I think, um, well, um, I did music because I thought I was quite good at it. <laughs> and in fact, I did win a Tibetan Music Award for Best Male Singer uh, for my first single. Well, you cannot say in fact. That was just that time. Obviously, everyone would have a different opinion on how my music is, whether good or not. Uh, but in general, music, uh, I think um, it can be a great tool to inspire people. A great tool to kind of inspire people to be good, uh, to, to be open, to be friendly, to, be, uh, to have a, a peaceful community, uh, to spread love. I mean even though what Bob Marley was doing and he, he was doing a lot of kinds of other stuff, but at least his music was really touching people in many ways to kind of spread the peace and happiness amongst uh, uh, everyone in the world. And I think uh, from my little understanding, it did, it did affect a lot of people. You know? It did bring a lot of people together in, in a way. And so I believe the music has the power to inspire people to do good. But I don't think music is a way that you can achieve Buddhahood or just by watching a movie or listening to music, you know. So, no, 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 that's not what I'm thinking. I'm, I don't know, maybe in the future some great musician, someone that much better than me may come and find a formula that is incredible. Uh, but for now, I think it's a great way to inspire people to the right direction. And uh, that's 
as it is. And that's about it, I think. Yeah. Also, your choice of profession, which is very interesting, being a training bodyguard. So, like, um, at the first glance, superficially, it might look a bit contradictory to me. Yeah, that's Buddhist. pretty cool, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always interested in that bodyguard. To so be a Buddhist and a bodyguard. So, how, how can this be compatible with Dharma? It is fully compatible, as a matter of fact. I think, generally, people have the idea of the bodyguard as somebody uh, aggressive and fighting all the time. Mm. This is absolutely not what bodyguarding is about. Bodyguarding is, a, as, as I see it, is a service to a person. You have a client who is in danger, who is at risk, and you are requested to help that person, to protect that person. Actually, you give yourself for that person. Uh, within the training and within your work, you are taught that if somebody shoots at the client, you are the shield. Mm. So somehow you have to, to give up the idea of your own life for the benefit of the client. So I don't see it as, as uh, contradictory with um, with the Dharma, uh, at the contrary. As Rinpoche mentioned, the, the motivation is, is the primary importance in all what we do. So if you are a bodyguard because you like the name of the bodyguard, because you, have, uh, you make nice tattoo, blah, blah, you, know, you want to show off, uh, this is your way, this is your ego, this is your, your tr ego trip, yes? Uh, if you enter into this uh, profession because you see a benefit you can bring, then I think the action itself becomes beneficial. Furthermore, it has helped me, and this was also part of my engagement, to enter in contact with some people who would have never come in contact with Dharma. Because uh, most people who enter into this profession, well, they, they don't come from a religious background or very spiritual background. Mm. Uh, so it has helped me to talk with some people, to enter in contact with some people who would have never go to a, gone to a gompa or to a teaching. But during the training or during a work, a job or during a mission, we could talk, we could share, we could exchange and some of them really become interested by Dharma and continued actually their own uh, interest into uh, the Dharma practice. So. I think once you are engaged into the Dharma and your aim is really at looking how you can help the others, you can help the others in thousands of ways. I don't see one way which is bad or one way which is excellent. It's the motivation which is behind. There are many stories in Tibet also about some, some Lamas or some monks who mm -hmm. were doing some crazy things, coming out of the monastery, sneaking, going to drink into some... Uh, bar in Lhasa and so on, but secretly they were high practitioner and they could, even though they were drinking and looking a little bit disturbed, but inside they were not. And their aim was to give to a certain amount of people the, the, the seed of Dharma and progressively they took them out of their environment or the bar and everything and they brought them to meditate and they brought them to a certain benefit. I'm not saying that this is what uh, everybody should do. Um, <laughs> it's like my example of Greg who's going to the bar and <laughs> meditating on Greg. It's not what everyone should do. Yes. But with, with the right motivation, we can do a lot of things. Yes. Mm. Then um, a question for Gurudev Chen about the name of the tourist uh, millennial Buddhist approach and like, the, mo the main slogan is uh, in this millennia, millennia of distractions, it is harder than ever uh, than ever before to practice Buddhism, but never has it been more relevant uh, than ever before. Mm. Um, so why why would you say this? Why is it uh, not even more relevant to practice? I think it's quite obvious. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, the level of distraction, the level of attachment that we have now is just off the roof uh, compared to the past. Uh, this is one 
thing that I think it's very true. Uh, if you think about the past, only the kings and the royal families or the nobles and the business, a few, I mean, it wasn't, in the past, it wasn't really that concept of businessmen. It was really the, the high noble families that were running the whole it's a show. And they were the only ones that got to live that luxury life and have all the, the luxury goods. Although, otherwise, all the other peasants were very, all had a similar kind of very normal and simple life. They were having their crops, maybe some were nomads. You know, they were making some profits probably, and profits were like grains, extra meat, whatever, right, extra potato. And, and, and according to what they were making, they would give a percentage to the state or to the king or to the noble families. And uh, so the level of people who are really trapped into sort of this pleasure world were just a few number of people. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that was a great time because all the peasants were living as a saint. That's not what I'm saying. But on a distraction level, it was very few. It's just mainly a few people were getting to live that sort of high life, and most normal people were just very simple life. They're very simple. I think if, we can, if people can look into history and can tell how people were living a thousand, two thousand years of a very simple life. Most now, huh? No way. Now people can even borrow or rent a Ferrari for a day. I mean, you have to pay an amount, but you can. You, you don't have to buy, but you can. You can experience that lifestyle. You can rent a nice house for a day of through Airbnb. You can buy a nice phone by not paying upfront, but giving a monthly payment. Basically, it's this sort of false idea that you can be like one of those rich people, huh? Huh? and so you get to kind of experience what they have, but you don't necessarily have what they have. Because you don't have what they own, which is obviously lots of money. You don't have all, you don't have all that luxury. But you, now that peasant, now it's like the city people who work in the factory world. But they still carry iPhones. They can still drive a nice car once in a while. They can still live that luxury lifestyle once in a while if they want to. And somehow, I feel like that can lead to a lot of delusion and suffering. Because they're living or thinking they could become something or they're becoming something when they're actually not. And when they hit rock bottom, they really suffer a lot. And from that point of view, I think so the distraction, the attachment, and all these kind of level has just risen to the top. And, uh, and now it's not just anymore just some rich people, but now it's everyone thinks they can have that lifestyle. And uh, anyways, that's just some example, I guess, one, one example. Yeah. That's why I feel like it's quite relevant. That, uh, that now these people that need to kind of figure out what it means, what is that, understand what is the truth, understand how emotion works. I'm not saying you cannot drive a Ferrari. If you want to, fine, but learn what means Ferrari to you. Are you just wanting to experience because some of your friends drove or is it because you're super attached to it and you think that is what it means to be a great person, to be able to ride a Ferrari? mean success. What, what does that mean to you? To really analyze a question. And so that is what one of my reasons of MBA tools to help people learn how to be aware of your emotion so that you won't be sucked into this sort of uh, 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 problems, I can say. A big part of disturbance in this society seems also to be like mass media and smartphones and internet right. and all these kind of yeah. social networks. Because in the past we didn't have mass media. And so do you think this is something detrimental to spiritual development? How does it affect the emotions and the state of mind and so on? I mean, yes, I mean, in some ways you can see it that way if you want to. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, we do believe in degeneration in the Buddhist world. And so I think, yes, I mean, yes, but... Um, that doesn't mean that we've lost hope. That doesn't mean now we're like, okay, you cannot give, use that as an excuse to practice less. Huh? Some people like to do that. Oh, you know, it's, this, it's, it's, this is the time now. We, this is degeneration time. So what, what can you expect? No, 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 that's not true. That's not, that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is just it's harder to, under, to reach Dharma because everyone is just, they feel that. Um, becoming rich or becoming like Kim Kardashian, uh, sorry, Kim Kardashian 
or, or like Jay-Z is the way to be, you know. In the past, it wasn't like that. You know? We didn't have these kind of av ways of becoming famous. It was either you're a king or not, that's it. And so religion was very powerful back in the days. But now, uh, they somehow becoming uh, to find freedom, you don't need religion. Because they think of the long, short-term freedom, right? The short-term freedom becoming famous, having a lot of attention, having a lot of money. And, and somehow mass media helps promote that, that sort of delusion, if I want to call it, or if you want to call it, or, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that just makes us harder to, to get connected with Dharma. Uh, but once you're connected, then there's no excuse. <laughs> then you, 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 you're open to the, it's an open book Dharma, so you can learn if you really put the effort and everything. Mm -hmm. No excuses. No, excuse me. No, no, no. Once you, once you get, once you connect it, that's it. Then there's no excuse. Okay. Okay, then for the final question of the interview, um, what is your most essential message to the followers of Buddha? How to remain a true practitioner of Buddhism in this, in this day and age? This will be a question for both. This. I would uh, simply follow what uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama always uh, focus on, which is kindness. I think if there is one thing everybody should focus on, is kindness. Kindness under all its form, we can talk about the care we have for the people around us, or even the care we can have for strangers if we are able to help other people. Uh, and it goes up to bodhicitta, so it goes up to the highest motivation possible. All this is somehow within kindness. So nowadays, this is important. Rinpoche mentioned the, the, the illusion uh, of, of this reality and the fact that this is not the ultimate reality. These are the two wings of Dharma, yes, bodhicitta and emptiness, bodhicitta and uh, the true nature of phenomena, and this is what we need to keep in mind. If we have the right understanding of causality and uh, the true nature of phenomena on one side, then we can take a little bit of distance from this mass media, from this uh, Facebook, uh, Viber, attraction and time spending. And the other side, if we have bodhicitta, if we have kindness, it will help us to keep the right focus. Not the focus for self-cherishing, not the focus for gaining things for oneself and trying uh, to be a rock star or whatever and, and, and get lost somehow in this ideal, but to uh, keep the motivation of helping the others. What can I do to help the others? And if a, a Dharma practitioner keep every morning keep asking himself or herself, what can I do to help the others? Then it reminds us, well, if I want to help the others, I need to remind myself of Dharma teaching. I need to remind myself that this is an illusion, this is not the, the finality in any way. I should pass that. And I do it for what? I don't do it just for me. I don't do it just for my own liberation. I do it because I want to help as many beings also to realize this and to reach that goal. So to keep the humility of being, I'm a practitioner like any other practitioner, uh, but my motivation is to help the others. My motivation is good, maybe, but I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the knowledge, so I need to practice, I need to meditate more, I need to pacify my mind, so to become better, better and better, and help more people. Well, um I think for me, uh, I would say it's just to really um, learn to analyze your mind. Learn to analyze your mind, learn to question. This is something that I'm really advocating at this tour. And so I just would like to repeat it one more time, this final message. Uh, for those who haven't seen, obviously, my get, got the opportunity to uh, come to my talks well it's just basically to be able to really uh, learn to understand how your emotion works um, 
because a lot of times sufferings are just caused by not keeping your emotion or mind, whatever you want to call it, in check. Sometimes I call the emotion or our mind a spoiled kid. It's like a spoiled kid. Sometimes we just let the mind do whatever it wants. If it's going in the wrong direction, just let it happen. If it's reacting to a certain emotion, just let it react. If we get angry, we just let it be angry. As a spoiled kid, we just let the spoiled kid just do whatever he wants. And the parents never tell him that's not right to do. If he shouts, so oh, what can I do? That's my kid. He, you know, he has um, some issues. He needs to express. Sometimes we like to. Some I've seen some people. They like to say, oh, he, just, he just needs to express. I'm like, hmm. maybe you need to learn how to. Maybe you need to uh, express a bit more to him, you know, <laughs> and how to, you know, behave. And similar to that, I think we have to learn how to keep our mind in check, and really question ourselves: Why are we getting angry? What is the cause? Understanding that a lot of times the main cause is just because of your own fear of change. It has nothing to do with the actual situation. The situation was just a mere condition that helped trigger that emotion within you. That was the fear of change. So understanding that. And once you understand the fear of change, you just focus on, on what can you do about it. If it's something that you can make a change to it, then make the change. If it's something that you cannot change, and learn to eliminate the emotion. If it's something someone passes away, and obviously you cannot bring him back. If it's something like a glass that you broke, you were attached to, if the glass is broken and shattered to pieces, you cannot bring the glass back into the normal way. So there's no point of suffering and, 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 and feeling pain that the glass broke because now you cannot bring the glass back, right? So that's when you have to learn to eliminate that emotion and cut it out. But if it's something that you can work on and say, a relationship is not working. And the relationship can be worked just because if you make one small change, if you know that, then make that change if that relationship is worth more than not doing it, not doing, not making that change. And if that relationship is more important, then make that change. Don't repeat the mistakes that your other partner doesn't like. Just make the change. So sometimes it's very simple. Uh, it's just a matter of how you think and how you discipline your mind yourself. And then thirdly, obviously, to have a more uh, a love towards others that is uh, really not something that, um, to be aware of what kind of love you have. Is this love that you, you, you is, this, is this a true love? Is this a love that, is this an unconditional love? Because a lot of times we love because of what the other person can do for you. And so just to really be aware of it and make sure that you're loving that person because of what you can do for the other having that concern. This is what His Holiness often says, is you should have the concern for others, their compassion, is, is, is to have that concern for others. And, uh, and a lot of times we don't think about it, but indirectly is the concern for me, you know, <laughs> that having the concern, what can, what can, how can I be treated well? Who will treat me well? Who will caress me well? Who, who would feed me? Who will take care of me? And you look for someone that can do that, can fulfill that. And then one who can fulfill that, you think, now you love that person because you start building this sort of emotion connection. And that is not true love. If you want to call it love, that's fine. But I call it the Hollywood love. And, and, and it's important to recognize that it's a Hollywood love and not an unconditional love. Once you recognize it's not the unconditional love and understand the benefit of unconditional love, then develop that. Conditional love is basically the love that is not conditioned to your own self-cherishing mind. It's the concern for others. It's what can I do for you? Or how can I help the other person? Because if you have that love for the other person that is not dependent on your own self-greed, then whether he or she wants to divorce you, if you know she will be happier or he will be happier leaving you and divorcing, then you will not suffer because you will be happy for the other person. But if, you, if your love is the Hollywood love, obviously you're going to suffer very much. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for inviting me. It was very, very a pleasure. It was a very good pleasure. Thank you.